Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to my Linux experiment. Installing a Linux distribution can be a tricky proposition. You're gonna be messing with your hard drive, with your partitions, you might fear to lose data or mess up your existing operating system. If you have never done it, it can be pretty tricky. So there are tons of advice on the internet on how to set up your partitions and what to do, what not to do. So I think it's time to make a simple video on how to install a Linux distro, whether automatically or manually. So let's start right after this. This video is sponsored by Linode, the largest independent cloud computing provider. Linode makes it easy to create your own secure personal space on the internet. Just about everyone needs a website these days, but if, like me, you've used simple drag and drop website providers, you know they tend to lack customization, lock your website onto their platform, tend to be pretty slow and charge extra for basic features. Linode makes it as easy as possible for you to deploy enterprise-grade WordPress, Drupal or even static websites in just seconds with their one-click apps. These apps basically give you the same tools that businesses use and allow you to truly own your content, make websites that are ultra-portable and ensure you only pay for what you need. So level up, start building your website, your projects or personal blog on a platform you can trust with Linode. Sign up today and get $20 in credit on your new Linode account using the link in the description. Now, obviously, the first step you need to take is preparing your installation. If you've been careful or if you followed the series, you already know what to do. If you haven't, there are plenty of videos that I made on this. Just take a look in the cards up top and just take time to prepare, select your distro, prepare the install media, do things right. Once your distro is picked and you have your install media created, just plug it inside your computer and boot from it. Don't forget the most important step of all, back up your data. Installing a Linux distribution will mess up with your partitions and your hard drive. You're going to have to make space for Linux on your existing hard drive. And as such, you might lose data. Don't hesitate to take a giant external hard drive and copy everything that's important to you. You don't want to resent Linux for having wiped out some of your data just because you forgot to back them up. Now, once your install media is done and ready and you plugged it into the computer, just boot from the computer and boot from it. If you don't know how to do that, there's a video on that in the channel. Now, Linux is a diverse system, and this is well reflected by the quantity of graphical installers that you can find on various distros. The most major ones, though, that you might be faced with are the Ubuntu installer called Ubiquity, the Elementary OS installer, which is for now only on Pop! OS, but will pop up on Elementary pretty soon, there's also the Manjaro installer called Calamares, but it's probably used on a lot more distributions than that. And there's the Fedora one called Anaconda. I don't know if these distributions invented these installers, but these are the big ones that use them. Now, your first step will be the keyboard and language selection in most cases. This is a very simple one. Just select your language that you want to use when you install your distro and select the keyboard layout that matches the keyboard you're going to be using. Don't skip this one because you're going to be asked to type passwords and usernames and maybe partition names if you go into manual partitioning. So you want to make sure that all special characters are recognized correctly. You can auto detect the keyboard layout and it's generally going to ask you to press a few specific keys just to make sure that you have detected it correctly. Don't skip this step. It might seem not important and of course you can change it later, but it's going to make a whole of a difference if you can just have the right keyboard layout while you install. Now the installation proper generally will offer you three options, or at least that's what the main Linux installer will do, which is the Ubuntu one. You're going to have the choice to either erase the whole disk and use it entirely for Linux. This will create just a main system partition and probably a swap partition as well, and erase everything that's on the disk. Only do that if you're sure and ready to move to Linux. Then the second option will be keep your existing OS and install Linux alongside it. So this is the option that you want to pick if you want to dual boot. If you want to keep Windows on Mac OS X, just pick that. You'll basically get a slider that lets you pick how much space you want to keep for the existing OS and how much you want to give to your new Linux install. And then there's the more complicated option, which is the manual installation. This is manual partitioning. We'll go into more details on that in just a bit. If you're a beginner, I would really recommend you not do manual partitioning. But if you're hell-bent on this, we're going to see the most frequent use case for manual partitioning, and this is having a separate home partition. Now, the most common case for people who want to manual partition is having a separate slash home partition. This means that all the users' files and directories will be stored on a separate partitions. If you don't know what a partition is, you sh probably shouldn't be manual partitioning, but just for the record, a partition is a virtual slice of your hard drive disk. It can be sliced into little pieces. Each piece is called a partition. 
So if you want to store your home folder on a specific partition, that means that you could reinstall Linux, just reinstalling and erasing the base system and keeping the slash home partition intact, which means that you don't have to copy paste all your user files back and from the disk, you just reinstall in place and keep all the existing files and config files in place. I generally would not recommend setting up a dedicated slash home partition, this is going to offend people, but honestly you're better off making a clean install and copy pasting your files to have a fresh start. Now let's see how to do manual partitioning. Basically Linux stores everything in one directory which is called slash and then inside subfolders. Every single of these directories can be mounted on a specific partition for those who need it. Some will need to mount for example their server content on a specific partition which might be in slash var and some will want to store their user files on a specific partition called slash home. So we're gonna see how to create the various partitions that a Linux system might need to boot and run smoothly and use the manual partitioning tool of the Ubuntu installer to do that. So the first partition that we need to create is the slash partition. This is the one that's going to contain all your system files and all your applications. It needs to be dimensioned accordingly, it's like your Windows partition. It needs to have enough space to install everything you need, if you dimension it too small, then you won't be able to install newer applications and it's gonna be a pain for you, so pick a size that's pretty big. Um, in terms of file system, most distributions will ship with an X4 file system and will propose that to you. You should probably keep that on unless you know that you need another specific file system. X4 is very good, you don't really need to change that. To be able to create this partition, you're gonna need some free disk space. Now to make some space, you can either delete the existing partitions or resize them. Deleting a partition will obviously delete everything that's on it, so if you delete your Windows partition, your Windows OS will be gone. So don't do that unless you're certain of what you're doing. You can also resize an existing partition. Let's say for example your hard drive disk is one terabyte and your Windows install only uses 500 gigabytes. You can resize the partition to use only 500 gigabytes and have some free space you can use to install Linux. To do that, most installers won't probably let you do it right off the bat. You can use Gparted, which is a tool installed on most live CDs from distributions and just click the partition you want to resize, select the new size and click apply. It's a very easy process, just be aware that doing that might result in loss of data if you're not careful. Now once you have that free space, click on it, create a new partition using the plus button and select the X4 file system and then the mount point. The mount point just means which folder of the Linux directory system will be mounted in this partition. Here we want to mount the slash directory because that's going to be our file system partition. Now the second partition we're going to create is your slash home partition. This is going to be the one that hosts all your users files, so it needs to be very big as well. This is going to store your Flatpak app installs, this is going to store your music, your photos, your videos, uh, your preferences, your config files, anything that you usually store in your user folder like my documents on Windows or in your user folder on Mac is going to be stored in here, so you need to have some space as well. So select some free space and create a partition out of that. Make sure to leave some free space after it because we're going to need to create some more partitions right after that, so don't use it all up. For this partition as well, you can select the X4 file system if you don't need anything specific. It just works well and you can select the slash home mount point, then click OK. So what are we going to do with the free space that we have left? The first thing is going to be a swap partition. This might not be that useful if you have a highly specced computer with a lot of RAM, but if you don't, you're going to need that. What a swap partition does is having some disk space reserved for when the system runs out of RAM. Instead of trying to write the program data into RAM, it's going to write them to disk. And as such, if you don't have any of that, your computer would just grind to a halt, waiting for the RAM to be freed up by the program that is currently using it. Which means most of the time your computer will be completely unusable unless you try and close something or reboot it. So you kind of need a swap file or a swap partition and the easiest way is to create a partition right at install. So just create something that's twice your RAM size. For example, if you have a 4 GB RAM computer, create a swap partition that's 8 GB large. That will be way enough. So you can just click on your free space, create a new partition, type in the size that you need. Honestly, anything other than 8 GB is probably way too much. You probably don't need to put that much. If you have 8 GB, don't put 16. 8 should probably be enough. And then select the mount point as a swap partition and click OK. And now we should keep just a little bit more free space, around 512 megabytes for the EFI partition. This is not needed if your computer uses a BIOS. If your computer is an older model, it's not gonna use UEFI, it's not gonna need an EFI partition. 
If your computer does need one, it's going to tell you when you try to launch the installer after the manual partitioning, it's going to tell you that you lack an EFI partition. So just go back, make some free space. About 512 megabytes should suffice. The EFI partition will just store files that are needed for your computer to boot and to be able to start the various OSs that you need. Now the last step we have to do is to select where to install the bootloader. The bootloader is something that will allow you to select which OS to boot at startup and actually boot it. Uh, this is the ugly white on black screen that you see on most dual booting machines, which allow you to pick between, for example, Windows or Linux or older versions of the Linux kernel that you already have installed on your OS. The simplest way is to install the bootloader to the exact same disk that you've been installing your system partition on. Don't install it on an external hard drive disk. If it dies or if you lose it, your computer won't be able to boot. So just use the system partition, the slash partition as the place where you install the bootloader, or at least on the same hard drive disk. And now you're done with that manual partitioning. This is the most frequent case. You want to have a system partition and a user-specific partition separated from it in case you want to reinstall something else or just restore more easily. I would not recommend you do that if you're a beginner. This is going to involve resizing your existing partitions, freeing up some space, creating various partitions. It can be tricky, you can lose data, I would trust 100% the GUI installers that Ubuntu or any other distro ships to do that for you. If you're not sure that you need a specific home partition and if you've correctly backed up your data, you don't really need that. Don't mess up with your hard drive if you don't know what you're doing. But now you're all done. You have the installer running and we can skip to the next step, which is user account creation. Now, most installers will ask you to create your user during the install. So this means that the installer will start doing its job and then it's going to ask you some questions about which user account you want to create. You're going to have to pick your name, which is the full name that's going to be used to describe the account. You're going to have to use a nickname, which is the one that's going to be used to name the subfolder where all these users files are going to be stored. And then you have the password, obviously, to select. You should pick a secure password, but not too complicated that you can't remember it. It's going to be asked of you every time you want to install something or when you want to tweak some low-level system settings. So try to pick something that you can remember easily. Now, if you don't see a user creation screen, don't worry. This means that the distribution will ask you these details after you reboot. It's basically an installer designed for OEMs, which is hardware manufacturers. And basically, they just want to do the install on their part, and then you will do the user creation. So that's why the user creation is done after you boot the computer. Once the installer is done, it's going to ask you to reboot the computer and remove the install media. So you can just click reboot, wait for the screen to tell you to remove your install media, unplug it from the computer, and wait until you see the ugly black screen that tells you to pick between your various OSs. If you've only installed Linux and erased the whole hard drive disk, you probably won't see a selection screen because there's nothing to select. But if you have Windows or Mac OS X installed, you'll be able to pick which one you want to start. And now your distro should boot and ask you to log in. If you haven't already created a user, now's the time that the distribution will ask you to do so, and then you'll just be able to use your desktop. So it's time to go nuts and get used to using Linux and the distribution you picked. And that's it for this video. As you can see, installing a Linux distro is not a super complicated process if you've prepared your work beforehand, you've backed up your data, you've chosen your distro, you've created your installed media disk. The installation itself is pretty easy. I would recommend that if you don't know what you're doing, if you're unsure of specific partitioning or whatever, just use the default options on the installer. It's way easier. It generally does a very good job of partitioning the disk. Rarely, if ever, messes up anything. And doing it manually, you might introduce some errors, problems, or lose some data. If you're not sure what you're doing, just use the existing options of the graphical user interface. Don't try to mess around with your own partitioning. You can learn about that later on specific machines that you don't care about losing data on. And if the partition layout is not satisfactory, you can always change it afterwards. You just reboot from a live USB and you can resize partitions using the gparted tool. You can resize partitions, modify ones, merge some. There's no issue with that as long as you're booting from a live ISO, uh, like the install media you just created in the last part. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, don't hesitate to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. If you really did like the video, I have a Patreon page. I'll leave a link in the description below. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!